The Ukraine war has, as a minimum, brought international humanitarian law and the trying of war criminals into sharper than normal focus. Arguably, it has required of us a complete rethink about what part, if any, international criminal law can play in stopping conflicts that may lead to war and in what ways it may have failed to deal with crimes committed in war. Arguably, the risk to us all of the present conflict, with talk of the escalation through use of, at this stage, tactical nuclear weapons, means that the scale of shortcomings by the UN, NATO, and such parts of the international legal order as have functioned must be confronted. We should face the present risk, recognizing its scale, and with minds open to the prospect of repetition, absent major reforms, perhaps of all institutions. For example, the public has become aware, as never before, of how Russia's power of veto in the Security Council of the United Nations can block trial by the International Criminal Court of the most obvious crime of aggression that Russia may have committed as absurd as Hitler having a veto in 1944 over who should be tried at Nuremberg in 1945 and 6. Can this be cured? Is it right, as some do, to propose a new tribunal simply because the existing one cannot be rectified by what the public would regard as common sense measures, namely removal of the veto power from any permanent five member of the Security Council who's engaged in war, or perhaps a more general reconstruction of the Security Council. Experts in the field talk on radio and television about the difficulty of proof in trials of anyone charged for crimes in Ukraine and of how long such trials would be. Is their length unavoidable? And does this beg the question of whether allowing trials at international tribunals to have lasted as long as they have, was that a well-intentioned blunder? Without doubt, the Yugoslav and Rwanda tribunals, for whatever reason they may have been created, have done immense good. They have generated a worldwide expectation that crimes in war would be investigated, with individuals tried and punished and those two tribunals have tried over 240 individuals. Some of the trials relatively uncontroversial, many effectively proving parts of otherwise controversial history, whatever judges say about history making not being part of their job. The tribunals laid the ground for eventual establishment of the long dreamed of International Criminal Court, which must survive and must have our support and attention. However, in many of the long tribunal trials, conflicting beliefs, ideologies, ambitions of the warring parties, festering throughout long and prolonged hearings, have led to false narratives being given airtime in the words of defendants and lawyers. Bosnia. 27 years after the killings in Srebrenica is stuck for several reasons. One is probably the growing counter-narrative of moral equivalence between on the one side Bosnian Muslims and on the other Serbia and the Bosnian Serbs, generated by endless trials because under the adversarial system, Absurd and even dangerous propositions have been given currency in those trials under the guise of legal argument, all to be swallowed by generations unborn when Srebrenica happened. And now, further violence in the region is realistically feared. In the desire to be fair to defendants, have the international tribunals and courts overlooked the value to bereaved 
to the bereaved, to surviving victims, and to all other survivors of World War II, that an imprimatur of judicial judgment within a year or so of war's end added to existing certainty about the moral right and wrong in war. The certainty that followed the Nuremberg trials and the end of the war itself allowed survivors in the Allied countries and in Germany to move forward, unlike Bosnian Muslim survivors of Srebrenica who spend all their time and all their energy looking back. Will trials or attempts to have trials of Russians for crimes committed in Ukraine last for years or decades with consequences similar to those suffered by Bosnian Muslims and Bosnia itself? Or can really serious procedural reforms result in trials of those who can't? Putin, most obviously, being short. If nothing happens for decades, will much delayed war crimes trials serve any purpose at all? When, or rather where, international humanitarian law has sometimes been proved wanting and war crimes trials have sometimes perhaps been shown to be deficient, may human rights law, which overlaps with international humanitarian law, the law of war, have been breached beyond what is justified in armed conflict and then disregarded in overlong tribunal hearings. If the law of war and the trials that follow fail mankind, may human rights themselves be more generally gravely at risk. Tonight's speakers have CVs available online to intimidate students and shame the rest of us. So they will forgive me, I hope, if I draw from each CV a core element that shows precisely why we have asked them to help us this evening. Lord David Hannay on my left, GCMG, Companion of Honor, was ambassador in the UK's permanent representative to the United Nations between 1990 and 1995, giving him from the United Kingdom's seat on the Security Council unrivaled knowledge of the powers, purposes, and limitations of the United Nations as it created those two important international tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Andrew Cady, CMG QC on my far left, Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of the CPS at the moment was the international co-prosecutor of the Khmer Rouge in the tribunal in Cambodia. He was there from 2009 until 2013, but he was prosecuting individuals committed over 30 years earlier, giving him unique experience of the functional but also the political difficulties as well as the value of prosecuting such historic war crimes. The Right Honourable Dominic Grieve on my right, Attorney General, from 2010 to 2014, widely believed to have had his political life suspended because of his respect at the cost to his own career for human rights is remembered by all for the courtesy and courage of his rapier-like objections to his own party's Brexit campaign. And no one could be better placed to consider this evening's topic as if, on behalf of fellow citizens of all of us, concerned both for safety and justice in a troubled world. Lord Hannay. Thank you very much, uh, Geoffrey. And um, if I may start like you did by asking whether everyone can hear all right, because I did actually have a bad experience in this church when I was asked to give a eulogy. And I thought I produced a rather eloquent eulogy, and people always think that. 
Uh, and uh, at the end, a friend of mine in the congregation said, I'm sure it was wonderful, but we couldn't hear a single word. But that was because I was up in the pulpit there, and that's probably uh, not a good start. But can you all hear? Right. No, the lady at the back shaking her head. You well, can't hear. Why don't you come further forward? There are some seats here. That's probably the easiest way to fix it, although not very uh, technically. Uh, Anybody who can't hear, yeah, seats. come to the front. There are seats here at the side. And please put your hand up the minute you can't hear, because there's nothing more infuriating than not being able to hear what you came for. Do you to okay. check again? Off we go. Yes. Well, I have to confess to some trepidation in accepting uh, the invitation to address this distinguished gathering of lawyers on a subject which was summarized to me as, quote, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has prompted doubts about the effectiveness of international humanitarian law generally, uh, especially in the light of the composition of the UN Security Council, while Russia sustains an effective veto on prosecutions at the International Criminal Court, end quote. Uh, that's the exam paper I was set, and Jeffrey uh, added some questions, very pertinent ones, uh, in his introduction. Well, I am no lawyer, although my father and one of my uncles were, and I sit as an independent crossbench member of the House of Lords, surrounded by much of the cream of your profession, from whom I learn on a daily basis, and who could very well have different views than mine on the matters I'm going to discuss. I will therefore address these issues more from a diplomatic and geopolitical angle than from a purely legal one. Now, since the UN, since the um, Ukraine crisis took uh, what we've now actually, in that way we have as human beings, forgotten in a short period of time, was that most of the experts on the 23rd of February thought Putin would never be so stupid as to do what he did on the 24th. That was the very common view. There were very few people who took the contrary view, although the intelligence experts produced large amounts of evidence to the contrary. But the experts all thought he won't be such an idiot to do, as to do it, but he was. So the UN has taken some heavy knocks since uh, Russia triggered that war of aggression against Ukraine nearly three months ago. Uh, and who could not have been moved by the anguish and the anger with which President Zelensky addressed the Security Council for being unable to brand Russia's aggression for what it is, a clear breach of innumerable uh, provisions of international law, not least the founding charter of the United Nations itself. It is, however, and here I would enter a plea for uh, understanding one point, it is as well to recall that at no point in time since the United Nations was founded in 1945 would or could its Security Council have been able to act against one of its permanent members. That's a simple fact. So this wasn't something that should have come as a surprise in February of 2022. It was something we've lived with since 1945. The veto for the five permanent members of whom we were one, uh, and France and China, not the same China, uh, and the Soviet Union and the United States were the others, uh, there, there would not have been a Security Council with the powers that are in the Charter, which are pretty sweeping powers, uh, often uh, misunderstood or misrepresented. They wouldn't have existed uh, because, just ask yourself the question, would Stalin or indeed Roosevelt and Truman have agreed if there hadn't been a veto, no, they wouldn't. So 
uh, those who believe, uh, and one of Jeffrey's questions was uh, that the Charter could now be rewritten to abolish the veto, I fear, I have to tell you, you are lacking in realism. And then there's the other question, why not eject Russia or suspend it because it has acted so egregiously? Well, the Charter does not actually provide for that, so there is no provision that enables you to do that, no process that would enable you to do that. Uh, and this was a route which was considered and tried uh, by the ill-fated League of Nations, and it wasn't a colossal success. Uh, so uh, I, I think that uh, myself, that it's not a road one would wish to go down, however, whatever one thinks about Russia's behavior. And you shouldn't overlook, too, that the UN and the body of international law it has built up in the 75 years of its existence and the tribunals of which Jeffrey has spoken, uh, the criminal court most obviously, but the Rwanda and the, um, and the uh, um, Yugoslav tribunals, and also, of course, the sort of hybrid ones uh, that uh, my colleague on my left was very closely involved with Cambodia, Sierra Leone, and so on. Uh, all that consists, however, of much more than the mandatory Chapter 7 resolutions of the Security Council about which one hears so much, particularly when they don't happen. Uh, the debate, so just remember this, the debate that preceded Russia's solitary and shameful veto arraigned it before what is sometimes called, quote, the court of public opinion, unquote, as it was arraigned very successfully and effectively at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, and so that Security Council frustration and deadlock was a first important step towards mustering worldwide support for tough economic sanctions. Uh, do not forget, too, the important symbolic steps of the strengthened uh, votes in the General Assembly, because that was even more decisive, uh, that then took place, and of Russia's suspension from the UN's Human Rights Council. Do not forget either the vital humanitarian work of the UN's agencies, the Refugee Agency, the Migration uh, People, the Children's uh, Foundation, everything. These are absolutely vital in circumstances such as occur in uh, Ukraine. And um, if you uh, look at that, uh, the High Commissioner for Refugees, the Migration Institutions, they're helping to mitigate the suffering from the largest migration crisis in Europe since the Second World War. And finally, on mitigation, I would say the personal intervention of the UN Secretary General, for which he attracted some, in my view, extremely misguided criticism when he went to Moscow and to Kiev um, to plead for a ceasefire and, above all, to plead for more humanitarian treatment of those caught up in the, in the um, conflict. Uh, that personal intervention uh, in Mariupol has, in fact, resulted now in the evacuation from that hellish place of quite a few people, not many compared with the many who died or suffered elsewhere in the country, but even a few is surely worthwhile, and he should be given credit for it. But that brings me to the vexed question of impunity from war crimes, the prima facie evidence of which accumulates uh, daily uh, in, in Ukraine, and uh, which uh, has naturally attracted a, a great deal of attention, rightly so. Well, I was one of those who, uh, immediately after the Russian invasion, I think it was actually the 25th of 
February signed an appeal to the International Criminal Court and its prosecutor, Karim Khan, to begin collecting evidence on the basis of which action could subsequently be taken. Uh, the positive reaction to that plea by the prosecutor was extremely welcome, as was the contribution that our own government is making uh, to the court's uh, resources in this respect. I think they've provided so far a million pounds to the court for that, and I suspect that will not be the last occasion they need have to dip their hands in our pockets, and rightly so. Um, but you do have to, uh, uh, and, and then I, I, I welcome too the appointment of Sir Howard Morrison, uh, a distinguished former judge of the International Criminal Court, to advise the government of Ukraine on the marshalling of the evidence that would have to be brought before the court. Um, is this route to justice uh, rendered nugatory? by the fact that the International Criminal Court is not mandated by its statute to bring charges of war of aggression. That's a, one of the questions that Jeffrey put. Uh, and by the fact that any uh, uh, Russian who is indicted, from President Putin at the top to the soldiers in the field down below, are unlikely to be brought to trial before the International Criminal Court. I don't believe that does dis, dis, have that effect, render it nugatory. Firstly, the ICC has shown, in the instance of several of its early cases, that it is ready to tackle the issue of command responsibility, uh, which is the, the, the link which will lead to Putin. Uh, and the cases of President Bashir of Sudan, under arrest in Khartoum, indicted for war crimes in Darfur, and of President Milosevic uh, of Serbia, uh, brought before the International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, in which our moderator this evening played such an important and distinguished role, they've shown that the wheels of international justice may grind pretty slowly, but they can produce unexpected outcomes. Should the international community go further than that, as some have suggested, and establish a new international tribunal like the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals after the Second World War, explicitly empowered to try cases of wars of aggression? I'm not at all sure that that would be either wise or effective. The citing of the Nuremberg and Tokyo precedents, precedents should remind us that those tribunals were only able to function as a result of the defeat in war of the offending regimes, the occupation of their capital cities, and the capture of their leaders. Well, in our nuclear weapons era, that's not going to happen. Uh, it is simply not going to happen. Uh, we are not going to march to Moscow. And so uh, it is, uh, I think, important uh, to bear that in mind if you want to weigh up the chances of an alternative route. Moreover, it's precisely that scenario, the scenario of Nuremberg and Tokyo, uh, on the back of the doctrine of unconditional surrender. It's that that Putin's favored scenario. He wants his people to believe that in his campaign of disinformation, he puts this all the time as a justification for urging what he promotes as a war for Russia's very existence as a nation state. So I don't myself think it would be terribly wise to play into his hands by validating that. And be in no doubt, and this is the final point I'll make, uh, suggesting this is not the road to go down, be in no doubt any serious attempt to set up a new tribunal would be intensely divisive, divisive right across the world. Uh, I think we've already uh, recognized that the support for the 
uh, positions that the West are taking over Ukraine is not as wide as it ought to be, as it might be, as it needs to be. Uh, it would be much less if it was coupled with a campaign to set up a new tribunal. So uh, it would, I fear, therefore not only be divisive, but it would in all likelihood weaken rather than strengthen the efforts being made to isolate and to sanction Russia economically, uh, which is what we are all, our governments are all committed to and are performing perhaps rather more effectively than might have been feared. Now it's often said that a country, and this was I think the last Donald Rumsfeld who said it, it is often said that a country goes to war with the armed forces that it has, not with the ones it wishes it had. Well, I would argue in favor of going to court with the instances which already exist, not with those we would ideally like to have. Thank you very much. Uh, before Andy Cayley, I am going to just check people at the back Hands up, if and only if you can hear. Okay, Andrew. Um, I was going to follow my notes. I'm, <laughs> I'm not now, which I know is a huge mistake as a lawyer to do that, to go off the script. But um, what I will do is speak a little bit about my experiences as a prosecutor in some of the international courts. Um, just to put this in some kind of context, I was prosecuting as a junior in the mid-90s, so really at the beginning of my career. In, in fact, almost by accident, I, at the time I was a solicitor serving in the army, in the British Army, in Army Legal Services, and the Yugoslav Tribunal had been just formed by the Security Council. Um, Lord Hannay was there um, while this was going on. And at the time, people felt that it had been established by the Security Council, the Yugoslav Tribunal, because the UN was really paralyzed in its ability to do anything else to stop the war. I mean, it's not a criticism, it's, it's a fact. Um, and nobody really expected the Yugoslav Tribunal to work, to leave any kind of legacy at all. Anyway, I got sent there. Somebody else within the army was offered the job. Um, so the UN went to member states because they didn't have enough people to staff this court. And the call came to London, um, as it has come from the ICC regarding Ukraine, to staff the court. And a um, job was offered to one of my colleagues who didn't want it because he didn't fancy living in the Netherlands, and I was single and I didn't have any ties, and I thought, well, it sounds quite interesting to go and do this. And I was sent for six months because people thought that the court won't last very long at all. And the court changed the course of my life and my legal career and had a profound effect on how I see the world. Um, Jeffrey mentioned the Srebrenica trial, the extermination of eight and a half thousand people in three days, in really scenes that were reminiscent of the massacre of Jews in the Ukraine in the mid 40s, and that, the mid 1940s, and that really had made a great impact, I think, on all of us who were involved in that case and its importance, and, I, and I'll come back to that. Um, so my life was really shaped by this world, not necessarily international institutions, but certainly international criminal law and my experiences. And I suspect a sense of idealism and purpose that it gave me in the law, which has remained with me um, to this day, a bit more difficult in my current job answering to Parliament on the failures of our domestic criminal justice system. Um, so I watched with real profound sadness when I saw the failures of international institutions 
after the invasion of Ukraine. And you know, you, you can go through them. We've touched on them already. So the UN Security Council couldn't act because of Russia's veto. So not only could it not refer the case to the International Criminal Court, it couldn't refer the crime of aggression, which it had the jurisdiction to do because, of course, Russia vetoed it, but it couldn't take any other measures under Chapter 7 of the Charter. It could do nothing. It was paralyzed. So it sent the matter, as it does procedurally, to the General Assembly, the, the Parliament, if you will, of the United Nations. And all that the General Assembly has done is to condemn Russia, um, and request that it withdraws from the Ukraine, and of course that has not happened. Then the Ukraine found a hook into the International Court of Justice. Interestingly, I mean, this is an interesting legal point. I, I sort of, I feel wrong actually to say, you know, there are these interesting legal points when thousands of people are being murdered. But under the Genocide Convention, there is a provision, Article 9, where any parties to the convention who have a dispute over its interpretation can go to the permanent court and ask for the judges to give an interpretation. And Putin and many of his, the, the other leaders in the Russian Federation had given genocide as a justification for invading the Ukraine, that there was a genocide going on in the Donbass. This word genocide is, is thrown around easily by political leaders, particularly leaders like Putin. And as a result of that, because this allegation had been made against Ukraine. Ukraine was able to go to the International Court of Justice and say, look, you need to decide whether this is genocide because we say this is nonsense, but that's what Putin says. And the court acted and it found jurisdiction for the Ukrainians and it was able to take what are called provisional measures to support Ukraine. And part of those provisional measures were to condemn Russia, um, ask Russia to respect international law, calling for the withdrawal um, of Russian forces from the Ukraine calling for the protection of civilians and of course nothing happens. European Court of Human Rights exactly the same, condemnation, um, going through the, uh, the convention, listing off all the breaches, Article 1, right to life, etc, um, etc. Et um, nothing, nothing. Um, condemnation, nothing else, then to the Council of Ministers of the Council of Europe, who've also condemned Russia and suspended them um, from membership of the Council of Europe, which actually probably in the long run is not such a great thing to do because you actually, you know, I, I agree with Lord Hannah, you have to go on talking with people. If you can't do anything more substantive, if you can't militarily intervene, then you have to go on talking. So, as I said, the ICTY, um, an institution established with no real hope of success, people called it a fig leaf. Uh, the UN was embarrassed that it couldn't do more. Many innocent people were being murdered. Millions became refugees. I was there in 95, horrified, actually, by what I saw. I think General Sinek Park was also there during that time. Um, horrified, absolutely horrified by what I was seeing. I mean, very new to me, my parents had told me about the Second World War, but when you go to a place and you see this level of destruction of civilian property and you see thousands of refugees on the move um, and you see the grief and the terror of it all, um, it, it, it leaves a lasting impression. But I will say this about the Yugoslav Tribunal. Um, it actually was a success. It was a success. Um, and in fact, Lord Hannay, we were having an email discussion and we were talking about the problems of these courts. And Lord Hannay said, you know, don't let the best be the enemy of the good. Um, in the sense, you know, these courts were good enough. They, they, they did work. The, the ICTY indicted 160 odd people. Sir Geoffrey Nice uh, tried Milosevic. Um, he died um, during the trial. But when I started in that court, there was absolutely no um, uh, idea, that there was no sense at the time that we would ever prosecute the leaders of the Bosnian Serb state, Mladic and Karadzic. And we did. We did. I drafted the Mladic indictment, actually, um, the amended one on which he was tried. And I have to say, when I drafted it, I never thought that he'd be prosecuted in the court. And he was prosecuted, convicted, imprisoned. 
So that court actually was a much, much greater success than anybody ever believed it could be. The international, let me talk briefly about the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, because that's a court which had its problems. So Jeffrey, how much time have I got left? Uh, um, a few more. Okay, a few more minutes. Um, I think that it would be great, uh, of great value if you could help us with the question of whether really long-term tribunals work in the way that the Khmer Rouge Tribunal did or didn't yeah, work. Yeah, okay. Um, so the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, very briefly, um, was a hybrid court. Um, there were a lot of problems in establishing the court because the Cambodian government wanted to control the court. Now, just for the younger people here, um, Khmer Rouge was an extremist Maoist political movement of the mid-1970s. Um, it ran Cambodia, it ran in the loosest possible terms, but it, it, it governed Cambodia between 1975 and 1979. And during that time, it either murdered, worked, or starved to death over two million people, 25% of its own population. Um, the court took many, many years to establish for reasons I won't go into because I don't have time to explain all of that, but eventually it was established uh, in 2007. Uh, the difficulty with the court was that it was the, the government of Cambodia, which frankly is an all, you know, democracy in quotes, it's an authoritarian kleptocracy run by an individual called Hun Sen. He wanted absolute control of the court because he had former very elderly members of the Khmer Rouge still within his political circle. And he wanted certain people tried, but not everybody. So the deal was with the UN that a domestic court would be established by international treaty and a UN mission effectively bolted onto the side. Um, so it wasn't established in the same way as the Yugoslav Tribunal, which was a product of the Security Council. Um, so I was the international co-prosecutor between 2009 and 2013. It was staffed, the court, by both Cambodian nationals and by internationals from the UN. So there were Cambodian judges and international judges, Cambodian prosecutors, international prosecutors, um, Cambodian defence lawyers, international defence lawyers. All of the Cambodian staff were bluntly in the pocket of the government. So any decisions that we tried to take were never really that independent. Um, Hun Sen had his finger deeply into the court. Um, was it corrupt? Yes. Um, I struggled with that every day. I still struggle with it now. Uh, we did two trials. The others were basically put off by Hun Sen because the judges and the prosecutors wouldn't cooperate with doing the third or fourth trial. The first trial involved the trial of the commandant of S21, which was an extermination camp in Phnom Penh that murdered 18,000 people over the space of three years, women and children, um, elderly people in the most horrific circumstances I could ever imagine, um, and certainly defying description, but absolute horrors in that place. Um, we prosecuted him, convicted him. He got 19 years after trial. I didn't do the trial, I did the appeal. On appeal, he got a whole life sentence. He was never released. He died in prison three years ago, uh, Comrade Doik. We then tried the four remaining leaders of the Khmer Rouge, very elderly people. Two of them died during trial. One before trial, um, she had dementia. Uh, one of the few female ministers within the Khmer Rouge government, the Minister of Health, um, she had dementia. We had to basically sever her from the trial. She died. Her husband, who was the foreign minister, he died during the trial. We ended up trying the deputy to Pol Pot, who'd been the leader of the Khmer Rouge, and the former president, Q Sam Pan. Um, we, we convicted both of them at trial, but Nguyen Chia, the deputy to Pol Pot, he died before appeal. Um, so the process, you can see, um, was not ideal. Would I recreate a court like that? Well, I would say that those two trials, the ones that we did, 
you know, constantly the Cambodian government talked about international standards. Um, I think they did meet international standards, those two trials. Overall, did the court satisfy what we here in the United Kingdom would regard as fair and decent institutions with integrity and independent judges? No, no, I, I wouldn't say that at all. But would I say that international justice is not something worth pursuing because of that? No, I wouldn't. Finally on the ICC, can I have one more minute? Um, finally on the ICC, the, the ICC was a product of the success of the ad hoc tribunal, so the Rwanda tribunal and the Yugoslav tribunal. Um, in my view, and I worked there for two years, it, it was not well set up. Um, it employed a very significant number of people who simply did not have the experience uh, to be involved in a court like that. What I'm saying now will be deeply unpopular with a lot of people, but it's the truth. Um, it had people that led it in the early years who were simply not qualified to be there because many people are appointed to these courts for political reasons and not because of their legal experience or qualifications. Um, we sent a high court judge. Um, so the United Kingdom has always sent people who were properly qualified to try serious cases. Many states sent judges who were academics, um, po political, uh, you know, friends of presidents, these kinds of things. I mean, this is the truth, if, if you look into it, unfortunately. Uh, many of the staff, again, were not employed on merit, and the results of that can be seen in many of the failures at the court. Kenya, for example, every single person acquitted in those cases. Bemba, on appeal, thrown out by Sir Howard Morrison. Now, do I say, upon you know, the basis of what I've just said about that court, do we not pursue international justice? Of course we do. Of course we do. Now, contrary to what others have said, I do believe that one day it's quite possible that Putin will be tried. And I only say that because when I was at the Yugoslav tribunal, I never believed that we'd try anybody for Srebrenica, and we did. And we proved the lies were lies, that these events really did happen. I never believed that we'd try the leadership of the Khmer Rouge because I just thought it, this is not going to happen. This court is so dysfunctional, we'll never get there. And we did. We did it. We did it. We may have to make many. We may have to wait many years, but these things are worth pursuing. They really are. They're important to the victims. And I'll never forget. I will close. I promise, Jeffrey. I will. I will yeah, yeah. All right. I, I will just say one last thing. I remember Khmer Rouge Tribunal after the conviction of Doik, um, a woman came up to me who had fled Cambodia in 1979 and left her mother and father behind, who had both been murdered in S21. And after the conviction and, and his imprisonment for life on appeal, she came up to me and she said, nothing, nothing in my life was as important to see this day because my parents died. They were tortured and murdered in that terrible place. And now I can, I can sleep more easily because 35, 40 years on, justice has been done. Thank you, Andrew. And before I uh, ask Dominic to look at the, what he's already heard and what he knows from the position of the citizen, uh, it's perhaps worth just adding that Andrew and I could both tell you more generally how international courts of all kinds are never free of political interference. Uh, he's given you some, but nothing like the full strength of the story of any of the tribunals at which he's worked. We won't concentrate on that because it's probably an unavoidable reality in the process of moving something forward. And if you concentrate on that, you don't really see the way ahead. Dominic. Thank you, Thank you Geoffrey. And, and as I don't want to repeat what others have said, it enables me, I think, to shorten my remarks because I found myself so much in agreement with David Hannay's outline of some of the political realities which I was going to touch upon in dealing with international tribunals. I once went to um, Salzburg and there is a, in the castle, there was a large Habsburg cannon which had written upon it the words ultima ratio regum. 
the ultimate rationale of kings. And I'm afraid the truth is that the ultimate rationale is force. States enforce the law. If we break the law in this country, we will end up in court because the state has the power to do that. And in the United Kingdom today, it applies everywhere. In the Middle Ages, there were bits of the country where the king's writ didn't run. And so when one's dealing with international tribunals, one has to recognize that as there is no overarching international authority, some might say that's a good thing, um, ultimately states can take action and if they are strong enough, they will never be brought to justice however badly they behave. It is no surprise that China, despite its gross human rights violations in a number of settings, is essentially immune from pursuit through the courts. Some countries, and we have to bear this in mind, like the United States, in fact, having originally signed up to the International Criminal Court, then decided they didn't like the look of it, um, and therefore withdrew their participation. And having withdrawn their participation, one has to accept that in view of the strength of the United States of America, the reality is that they are unlikely, if there are serious violations, ever to be brought internationally to account. Although that doesn't mean that international pressure can't be brought upon them. And one of the complaints which is made about the International Criminal Court, and it is, I think, a valid one, is that the countries which tend to end up, or their citizens to end up, in front of the International Criminal Court are often what might be described as weaker states, which can be effectively coerced by the leverage of others into accepting court jurisdiction. Let's face it, that's what happened essentially with Milosevic over Serbia. So a willingness finally to bend because the political advantages of bending to the will of the United Nations as expressed through the International Criminal Court was seen as being more advantageous than protecting Milosevic. So ultimately, this is, and I think inevitably, a flawed process can't escape that. But that doesn't make it an invalid one, however chaotic and difficult it might be, because I think that over time, the standards of behavior of states and individuals within it are subtly raised by the evidence that individuals can end up in front of international tribunals for breaches of international humanitarian law. And it's a drip feed which we need, as a country, to add to. And indeed, we have been fairly consistent, although it is worth bearing in mind, as I look back at my time as Attorney General, and Andrew will remember this, um, that there were times when the United Kingdom government thought it exceptionally irksome that allegations, for example, of misconduct of UK forces in Iraq um, should have to be investigated. Um, and some will remember the international uh, Iraq historical allegations um, uh, process and wanted it to stop. And when they wanted it to stop, because we were signed up to um, the ICC, I had gently to point out, well, either we do it ourselves or somebody else is going to come along and do it for us because we accepted that jurisdiction. And, perfect as it may have been, ultimately the IHAT process did, in my view, work, if only mainly in establishing that in many cases the violations that had been alleged had not occurred. So difficult as it may have been, it was good for us. And I don't think has ever actually received the recognition in the work that uh, was done on it uh, for achieving that outcome. So for all those reasons, I happen to think that the international tribunal system is the only show in town. And if we were to abandon it, uh, we will, I think, see a deterioration in behavior. Russia's behavior in the Ukraine is, I think, a chilling example of here's a country, after all, signed up to the European Convention on Human Rights, quite apart from the Geneva Conventions. 
which seems when the conflict set out, leaving aside the question about the crime of aggression, to have simply conducted itself in a manner which is only too reminiscent of behavior during the Second World War. And it's that which we need to try and counter. And the law can play an effective part in doing that. And I agree with Andrew that it's not impossible that eventually we will see Putin brought to justice because you never know how the political impact of the existence of humanitarian norms will ultimately play out if, for example, he were eventually replaced as Russian leader by a regime which wanted to restore its international credibility. So for all those reasons, I am a great believer in this system, imperfect though it is. Uh, it needs us as lawyers to uh, sign up to it and to argue for it, because as I've indicated, there have been occasions, even in the United Kingdom, where people seem to think that it would be much nicer if we had an easier system. And as you may recall, the government introduced legislation not so long ago until it was got rid of successfully in the Lords to seek to remove some of the requirements to observe international humanitarian law, or at least the ability to investigate it, um, from UK forces, something which I should add attracted massive resistance within the armed forces themselves, which I think shows how you can raise standards. And before we despair, I'll just say in conclusion, we undoubtedly, as we can see in the Ukraine, live in a violent world. But I think sometimes we underestimate the extent to which, despite our gross imperfections, the world is in fact a much less violent place than it has probably been at any time since humanity began. And for that, we have to be thankful for the rules-based system that we've been able to establish. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before I throw uh, things over to you for questions, I think there's one question I'd like to ask of Lord Hannay in light of the general support for the system and inching forward from all our three speakers, but in very different ways. And it's really this, Lord Hannay, is there the possibility that you could reach a position of such danger and are we in that position, that inching forward has to be replaced by something more radical? Well, uh, it was, of course, so replaced, or rather it didn't exist, so it couldn't be replaced, but it was what happened during the Second World War. Uh, the Allies in the Second World War decided that the only outcome of that war was unconditional surrender. Uh, they subsequently, historians have often criticized that and said that possibly it made the war last longer because it only offered one outcome, which was the total defeat of Germany, Italy, and Japan. Uh, that, that was uh, occasioned by the appalling crimes committed by those regimes. Uh, and it was generally reckoned, I think afterwards, to have been a, a necessary approach to that conflict. Uh, nuclear weapons didn't exist in those days. And I do think nuclear weapons have made a difference to that, because if Hitler had had nuclear weapons, if he'd not been so unwise as to concentrate his efforts on ballistic missiles with very small uh, explosive charges in the nose cone and had instead uh, concentrated on developing a nuclear weapon, uh, well, uh, some of us might not be here. Uh, it was, in any case, uh, so uh, I think it has introduced a new element in it, which is why I said so flatly uh, what people are a little bit reluctant to say on the public record, which is we're not going to march to Moscow. Uh, it's as, you know, that, that is a simple uh, statement of, I think, the intention of all our governments, which is why uh, NATO and the West have been extremely careful not to get involved in a direct uh, confrontation, which has, of course, been 
helped a great deal by the heroic resistance of the uh, Ukrainians, uh, which has not posed the awkward question, uh, do we let Putin roll over Ukraine uh, yet? I don't think it probably will, but uh, it hasn't certainly yet. So I, I think it's difficult to answer your question in the nuclear age, I really do. Uh, I don't think we can ignore that. And that is not to go down the, in my view, uh, erroneous view that if the Ukrainians had not given up the nuclear weapons that they found on their territory when they became uh, independent in the 1990s, though interestingly no one ever seems to remember that actually Ukraine has been a member of the United Nations since 1945. Uh, when Stalin insisted that Belarus and Ukraine should also, as well as the Soviet Union, be full members of the United Nations. It didn't signify anything, of course. They sat in the Soviet mission and did what they were told. Uh, but, um, but nevertheless, uh, I think, uh, therefore, it is really difficult to uh, answer the question, your question, about are the circumstances which would override uh, when you're talking about uh, nuclear powers. Uh, I, I think it's, it's better not to go there, frankly. Thank you. Does anybody in the audience have a question? Yes. I can't see whether it... Yes, I can. Here it comes. Hi. Um, can you hear me okay? Um, my question is, given the consensual nature of international criminal law and the reluctance of powerful countries to sign the Rome Statute, how do you think that the International Criminal Court's decision to investigate Russia of its own volition will change the landscape of international criminal law in the future? Now, I didn't hear that very well, which is probably my dodgy hearing. If any of my colleagues did hear it, they can answer it, otherwise they'll have to have it translated. Not translated, explained. It's, it's not you, it's the microphone. Did, did any of you hear it fully? If I, can, if I, get, it, if I get it right, you're, you're essentially asking um, whether or not the prosecutor, actually, the prosecutor was gonna pro promo to start an investigation, but in the end, it was a referral. It was a, it was a, it was, so a group of states got together and referred the case back, but what you're asking, I think, is, um, what effect will that have on an international criminal justice when major states like China, Russia, United States are not members of the court? Is that about right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, well, it's a very difficult question to answer, frankly, because the, um, uh, and, and, uh, the list of people who are not members should be extended, of course, to include uh, India and Pakistan yeah, too, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, who uh, India, in the case of India, is a country that elects its leaders. Um, so it, it is really a pretty difficult uh, question to answer. It was always clear, and uh, Dominic, I'm sure, would, uh, would, who was in government or in the opposition front bench at the time, that when the Rome Statute was uh, negotiated, it was always clear that it would not have universal uh, uh, adherence. Uh, that, was, that was, the United States uh, position was in some slight doubt, though although they signed it, uh, it was clear that it was never gonna be ratified by the Senate. Uh, so in fact, it would never become, uh, United States membership would never become law. And China and Russia were quite clearly never going to. So the choice, that faced the negotiators of the Rome Statute, of whom our government was one, a supporter of it, was do you go ahead with a treaty which does not cover everything, everyone, or do you do nothing? And that's where I get my sort of question, the best being the enemy of the good. The best, obviously, is an international criminal court in which all 190, whatever it is, members of the United Nations are bound by it. But that's not gonna happen at any time in the foreseeable. So is it better to have something that is incomplete? Well, it was actually quite considerably strengthened by giving the Security Council the power to extend 
uh, the jurisdiction to a country that had not joined it, and that was used in both the case of Sudan and Darfur, and it was used in the case of Libya. Um, and, uh, but it could not be used in the present case we're talking about because of the Russian veto, and it could not be used in the case that Jeffrey has been putting a lot of effort and nobly into the examination of the Uyghur because the Chinese would veto it. So again, you're, always, you're still in the sort of best and enemy of the good situation, whether it's the membership, or the, uh, the jurisdiction of the court extending to everyone, or whether it's uh, there being ways in which the court can be prevented even when there's overpowering evidence that it should extend it to a country that is not covered by the jurisdiction is blocked from doing so. So there's no simple answer, I'm afraid. I, I was just going to add, Clearly, the reference um, adds to the pressure of worldwide public opinion on the states concerned. But it is, in a way, a gesture because it is unenforceable. Um, and uh, because of the way the United Nations is configured, I, I can't see how it can proceed anywhere in light of the veto powers of a, of a country with Security Council veto. Um, but as I say, it's part of this process by which inch by inch a rules-based system grows. And I think we should see it, therefore, in a positive way, but I don't think we should expect much of it. A question, first of all, from the online audience, picking up, as it uh, is the word granular detail of what we've just heard, from Nanda Kumar's Sarivatsa. The ICC has historically struggled to secure the cooperation of its own member states in the context of investigating situations, collecting evidence, and executing warrants. Does the panel have any view briefly on that? And in particular, will the present gravity of the situation, if it is grave, improve that? Um, Andrew, quickly. Yeah, I mean, that, that is a, that's a very difficult issue. And I remember very clearly um, after al-Bashir, the president of Sudan, was um, an arrest warrant was issued for him in respect of crimes in Darfur, including genocide. And he landed in various countries which were members of the court, including South Africa, I think, uh, yeah, where, where he was not arrested <laughs> and where there was an obligation <laughs> to arrest him, but he, he flew in and out for a meeting um, of the African Union. So it is a real problem. But to sort of directly answer the question, all I can do is really give my own experience that when I began working at the Yugoslav Tribunal, we had exactly the same problem in 1995. Um, we had no cooperation, very little cooperation, except with the Bosniak state, um, the Bosnian Muslim dominated part of Bosnia. Um, we only had cooperation with them. We had no cooperation with the Serbs or the Croats. Um, and we had very little in the way of enforcement powers. We didn't have a police force. Everything had to be done consensually. So I would say that these things develop. So as the years went by, the stature of the Yugoslav tribunal increased. Um, we tested various legal tools in the courtroom. Um, including summonses, um, including uh, orders from the court to gather documents, and we just chanced our arm, essentially, and got orders from judges, which we didn't really know whether they would be complied with, and they were as the years went by. I think it did improve. It did get better, and yes. Is the gravity of the present position some, such as to give encouragement for more rapid improvement. It's maybe something that Lord Hannay would have an observation on, if, if you know how, because he knows how they do and don't behave in the Security Council. Well, in the case of Yugoslavia, as I'm sure you're aware, the, there was a switch in American policy. Uh, and when the Americans first went in, uh, when NATO first went in uh, and forced the uh, Milosevic and the Bosnian Serbs, to come to date and, and to sign an agreement. Um, there was a strong resistance because there was a very big American presence in the NATO a mission there. There was a strong resistance to using them to arrest indicted criminals. 
and at a certain point in time, the Clinton administration uh, changed that policy. Uh, we, I believe, the British government of the day, always wanted to do that, to, to arrest criminals when they, were, when they could be found. Uh, and the Americans then changed, and the result was that a whole succession of people ended up in front of the court. Not, of course, Mladic and, and, and um, uh, Karadzic, because they were in Serbia, but there were people who were found in Bosnia uh, that way. And that was due simply to a change in the policy of the US administration as the uh, country which called the shots in NATO because it was a NATO force that was policing Bosnia. I don't know if that's right, uh, yeah. Dominic. I think that's a roughly... I think roughly. it is right. And, 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 I mean, the, the other thing I was just going to, to add is, of course, if you are arguing for respect for an international tribunal, then it also means that you yourself have to show respect for it. So there is a knock-on consequence uh, for states, which, as I was explaining earlier, may at times find these things a little bit irksome. Um, you know, even what I would like to think are responsible Western democracies doesn't mean that they are necessarily perfect. And so I think it, it, it draws attention to the fact that you have got yourself to observe the rules that you have created. Another question from the hall. General Sinek Parker. Uh, General Sinek has been invited, um, and so he's especially, he was commander of the uh, British Army, and he's uh, had a lot of experience working with the Ukraine military. So he gets more than 30 seconds. <laughs> um, I, I can't quite work out whether I'm reassured or troubled by what I've heard. Can you hear at the back? Okay, I, sorry, I know check. that there's no military solution to this, mm -hmm. that, that this is a collective effort along diplomatic, economic, judicial, and military lines. But as a soldier, I had always hoped that there would be people working very carefully on the other lines of activity that would get us to an objective which is set by our great strategic coalition. And in, in the case of Ukraine, we're not going to march on Moscow, but we are, I hope, going to set conditions which will put things right from a dire act of international barbarism. My question is, to what degree from what, what we've heard can we rely on the judicial line of activity? I talk in a rather linear way as a soldier, but the judicial line of activity, not the one that's necessarily punishing the soldiers on the ground, but the one that sends a message to the global coalition, which includes India and China and all these people who are not yet on our side, to what extent could we expect pragmatic judicial activity to bring people to account at the highest level to play its part in achieving our overall objectives, which must be to have a benign Russia that respects the borders of Ukraine. And a benign or compelled benign China. That's, that's a, a difficult question to answer because uh, looked at politically, um, we need to persuade the Russians without going to Moscow uh, that this conflict is not worth it, that there needs to be a ceasefire, that they need to withdraw from the territory that they've invaded, although getting them out of the Crimea might be very difficult, and uh, that there has to be then a negotiated solution. Um, and, of course, in the course of that, there will be, interestingly, relevant to this discussion, there will be all sorts of arguments, depends who's still in power in Moscow, about the extent to which you want to push the view that there needs to be justice for the flagrant breaches of international humanitarian law which have taken place, or whether, in fact, they've just got to be buried for the sake of achieving a negotiated solution. I mean, I can see that as a possible issue that may well come up. Um, 
There is a role at the moment in the conflict. I mean, there have already been, I think, in the Ukraine, several Russian soldiers who have been arrested and charged with war crimes uh, because it looks as if they can be identified as people who have massacred civilians. Um, the, the sword of Damocles element of justice is, I think, can be very powerful. But on the other hand, it does raise the difficulty, as I say, that when you're trying to come to a negotiated solution, the people who are the perpetrators have nowhere to go. And that can sometimes make the solutions more difficult. I think we have to accept, as lawyers, as if you miss the, <laughs> the messy compromises of trying to achieve reasonable and just outcomes. But how this is going to play out, I don't know. But certainly, the emphasis that I think we have rightly placed on the maintenance of international humanitarian norms is absolutely justified, and we should relentlessly pursue it, particularly when, at the moment, there is absolutely no sign that Russia is prepared to compromise at all on anything. Yes, I think, I, I think what you're touching on, really, is the debate about whether there is an inbuilt and insoluble tension between justice and peace. Uh, do you face a, a question at some stage, do you want peace or do you want justice? And uh, I myself have always, when I've spoken on the subject as a non-lawyer and a, uh, someone with no, and a non-military person, as someone with no authority whatsoever, I've always resisted that argument because it seems to me that you can have both justice and peace, but it's a very awkward uh, equation to resolve, and probably there is no overall a resolution to it. You just have to take it case by case. But I mean, just to give you an example in the present case, let's say uh, it became possible to envisage a ending of hostilities in Ukraine on a basis that the Ukrainians themselves would accept not because we told them to. That is the mortal sin of uh, Munich, the mortal sin of Yalta, and not that, but one they accepted themselves. Uh, and let's assume that by that time the International Criminal Court had indicted President Putin, but of course not got him before the court. So do we, should the peace settlement there be dependent on Putin being surrendered to the court. Well, that would be a pretty big decision to take. But equally, if Mr. Putin said, I'm not gonna make this deal unless you annul the indictment, withdraw the indictment, that would also be a big, so don't let's go there. Uh, we're a long, long, long way away from that. But it do, there, is a, there is, I think, some tension between justice and peace, but one should never allow it to, I would argue, to convince you that it's got to be one or it's got to be the other. Uh, David Owen was much, in, in, was much strong believer in it having to be peace and not justice. And I, uh, well, not for the first time in my life, thought he was wrong. Uh, so I don't think um, uh, that is, uh, it, it's not something that's capable of solution in a general way, but it, it shouldn't be allowed to overcome the efforts we're making. Gentlemen, do you want to come back on that? The only, the only observation I would make is, is it all rather depends on the outcome that you have set. And again, I'm being a bit military in defining an outcome. But you've got to be quite careful that what you want to achieve is, achieve, is achievable. Uh, and, and therefore, the debate over the status quo ante that, that is Crimea part of the condition. What, what, what do you want to achieve as a result of this weaving of the interlocking lines of activity is, is the heart of the challenge that we face. It's it, it, some, some interesting issues, and it also, I think, dovetails with issues around democracy and legitimacy. Medieval kings could go to war over territory, and then depending on who had the upper hand, you came to a compromise by which the weaker party surrendered the territory to the stronger. There was no consultation with the inhabitants. It was just done. 
Nowadays, we live in a, a world where democratic legitimacy is centered upon consent. And so for a country like the Ukraine to say, I'm going to compromise with Russia by parting officially with sections of territory which had all voted, as it happens, to join the Ukraine <laughs> in, when the vote took place in 1990, whenever it was, 1991, um, is almost impossible. Um, and thus, because of that, has the capacity to perpetuate conflict. Um, and I think there is some evidence that modern wars are very hard things to bring to an end. And I think that's a, it's an interesting challenge internationally. And Lord Anne will know more about this in a way <laughs> than me. But, it, but it's always struck me with my political hat on that it's one of the, the, the difficulties of in part brought on by countries which claim democratic, and sometimes do, and are democratically legitimate. You can't part with your citizens in the way in which would have happened 200 years ago. Andrew, we are running close to the end of time, so I'm going to put you on the spot with a short answer to a question drawn from the last exchange, if I've understood General Snick's concern correctly. If you had a magic wand and could do one thing with the international justice system, overriding the concerns about reality expressed by Lord Hannay and indeed by Dominic, what one thing would you do f for the resolution of the justice problem in this case that might have an effect on others, they've already been named, who might do the same thing? What change? One of them. I would say to get, and this will sound quite odd actually, because some people may disagree with me, but to get the United States to sign and ratify the Rome Statute. Thank you. Now, are there any other questions from the hall? I, I've lost my um, tablet so reference to a question, so if somebody can complete it for me. Any more questions from the hall? It's as if not, I'm going to ask you a question before we close it. And I've got, I know, one question from the online that I want to reflect. Some of us who are older uh, have certain views about the present position in which we are, in which we find ourselves. Would any of those of you who are younger like to say what you feel about the present situation, to what extent you genuinely think it's okay and manageable, or whether it's really dangerous. Would anyone like to tell us? I'm not going to pick on someone, but it'd be nice if one of the students would like to say how they see the present circumstance. I suppose it's not so much a question but a response to, to what you've just said. Um, I suppose my feeling on it is you hear a lot about nuclear and the big dangers of it becoming nuclear. And when I speak to people who are older, there's mixed reaction in that some people say this is unprecedented and that Putin is potentially very dangerous and other people who say there's always kind of been this background worry about nuclear and it's never kind of amounted to anything. So I suppose my feeling is of confusion of the dangers of the nuclear element and whether that is actually something that geopolitically is, is a massive concern and that we should be legitimately really concerned about the threat of actual nuclear war or whether it's largely postulating between, you know, yes. large figures um, and it's being used as a tactic rather than as a, this could actually become our, our soon reality. My, my, my political instincts are that n nuclear war is impossible to control, likely to be devastating, and, and lead to mutually assured destruction. So unless one is dealing with a madman, uh, or with a country that has been pushed to its existential limit, 
I find it hard to take seriously Putin's threats because uh, they simply seem to me to be the classic um, sort of thing, the playground bully. Uh, now, that said, the West's response to it has been very measured. We haven't intervened directly. We have avoided a direct military confrontation. And there are some who I occasionally speak to. I have a son in the army who say, you know, if we don't take him on now, when are we going to take him on? But miraculously, the Ukrainians have shown a remarkable competence at doing it themselves, although that one leaves, leaves one feeling slightly uneasy that we're leaving it to somebody else. Uh, when it's probably a collective responsibility. But I think the approach is right. But I think beyond that, if Russia wants to launch a nuclear war, it can. And that was the case six months ago and 12 months ago. But actually, the world has survived pretty well without. So it's not a subject that worries me when I go to sleep at night. Any uh, other? Sorry. Perhaps, any... Perhaps, you could, perhaps you could reflect on the following irony. In January of 2022, the five permanent members of the Security Council, the only recognized nuclear weapon states legally recognized, uh, endorsed, re-endorsed the Reagan-Gorbachev statement that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. Uh, you could perhaps reflect on uh, how uh, Mr. Putin managed to get his mind around his saber rattling a mere two months after he had subscribed to that view. Nobody else of the younger members wishes to comment on their perception of risk. I, right. One more? Yes. Good evening. Can't hear you. Good evening. I'm sorry. Um, in the 90s, Malaysia was prepared to send battalions to uh, Bosnia to help aid in the humanitarian crisis and also to help in um, the prevention of atrocities there. And yet, it was not given uh, any mandates or any permission by the United Nations in order to send in that assistance. There was no uh, threat of nuclear war then. So I have to ask, uh, is uh, bureaucracy and politics really one of the main uh, hurdles to, towards achieving justice and uh, peace in ending conflicts? Uh, and that, I, I put it to the panel to please comment on that. Quick answer, and then we'll draw it to a close. Andrew? Can you repeat the question? I Can you repeat the question, I'm afraid? The panel? Um, Just quickly. Is bureaucracy and politics really one of the main hurdles here to achieving justice and uh, uh, to resolve conflicts? Because there were no nuclear weapons in, in, in the Balkans, and if there were, there was no really threat. There was no threat to use them. It was, it was, a, it was a civil war. It was wars between uh, very closely tied communities who were living with each other side by side, and yet uh, nothing was done, no mandate, no... Uh, people who wanted to help were effectively barred from helping. Andrew? I, I mean, I, I didn't actually know that about Malaysia, um, but I mean, I think we've covered the ground already, politics always plays a very significant part in international justice, it's a reality, but I don't believe it's a reason not to pursue it. That's my experience of it. Um, there will always be these, this tension that, that exists, but I do still believe international justice is something worth pursuing, because I think probably in 200 years' time, and I'm long dead, the international justice structure will be much more effective and, and probably if we're all still here and have not been all destroyed by nuclear weapons, which you know, probably I hope will, will never happen, I think the international order will be much more effective then. Anything to add? Well, just to say that I, I mean, something you mentioned about Bosnia triggered off my recollection of certainly uh, four of the most painful years of my life. 
uh, struggling with this uh, very difficult problem. But it was not, in fact, a civil war. It was a war of aggression by the Bosnian Serbs and the Bosnian Croats against the Bosniaks. Uh, that, I think, was what the court finally ruled uh, in most of the cases that were brought before it, although, of course, they did try uh, at least one Bosniak, uh, I think, for war crimes as well, but not for the crime of aggression. Uh, so uh, I just want to correct that, that point that you made in that respect, because I think it was, at the beginning, it was a view very strongly held in this city, uh, in the government, the major government, that it was a civil war and that we shouldn't be getting involved in somebody else's civil war. And I'm afraid to say I think that was a bit of a mistake. Ladies and gentlemen, we've heard a lot, all of it really moving in a similar direction, uh, hoping that at the end of the journey, there will be a better rules-based international legal system providing there is time enough. Linking the following question from Charles Littlewood as follows. In the panelists' opinion, do international courts and tribunals play any sort of preventative role? Would a would-be genocidaire ever be moved to change course by what happens in the justice system? and perhaps reflecting on General Sinek's concern about what might happen in a justice system that could make a difference in other parts of the world where similarly strong men might do similarly dangerous things. Is the following completely idealistic thought worth having in mind? Pasha Talat, who led to the butchery of over a million Armenians in the First World War. The Kaiser himself, Stalin, if he intentionally starved millions to death. Hitler, Milosevic and Mladic, and now Putin, probably have one thing in common. And that is probably that if before they did the things for which they are condemned, they'd thought realistically they would be caught, handed over, tried, and sentenced, they would not have done what they did. Is there a role to play by international justice? I'll let Madam Treasurer express the last words. Well, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Thank you on behalf of us all to our panel, to Lord Hannay, Andrew Cayley, Dominic Grieve, and of course to Geoffrey Nice for organizing this evening. I think we've all been informed very much about uh, the situation, not only in Ukraine, but also in relation to international justice. And I think we will all go away better informed, wiser, more realistic, but with a little bit of hope at the end of it. I think it's very important that the discussion has focused on what we can do and the value of what we do have and the institutions we have uh, whilst not perfect, as we've heard, uh, they are better than having nothing at all. And we're very grateful to our panellists this evening for their gathered wisdom in the uh, diplomatic field, the law and politics for coming here this evening and talking to us. And in particular, I'd like to thank uh, Geoffrey Nice for all the effort that he puts into the social context of the law series on behalf of the Inn. I'd also just like to remind you, if you look at the form that you have, a little uh, flyer, there is a QR code for reading. There's a very good long list of 
uh, other things that you can read arising out of what we've discussed this evening, uh, which is also on the website. So if you want to follow up some of the themes uh, of what we've heard this evening, there is a wealth of material you can look at. So thank you very much this evening. Uh, we've very much enjoyed it. And as I say, it's been a tour de force from all of you. Thank you.